All right, so it is 10 o'clock. I'm gonna go ahead and get started because 30 minutes is not a lot of time and I have a lot that I wanna share with you guys. Um, so first off, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Taylor. I'm a licensed professional counselor intern in the state of Texas. And we are here to talk about child anxiety today and some strategies that hopefully you guys can use with your kids. Um, so we'll go ahead and pull up a little presentation. And like I said, there's gonna be a lot of information today. So if I'm going through quickly, I apologize. I just wanna get as much out as I can in these 30 minutes. Um, but we're gonna have time for questions at the end and you have your little chat function as well. So if anything comes up while I'm talking that you have questions about, go ahead and put it in the chat and I will try to answer it if we have time at the end. Let's see. So, oh wait, hold on. Let me see if one person waiting. There we go. Okay. Okay, can everyone, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. I'm hoping after today that you guys will have a better understanding of what anxiety is and how to recognize it in kids. It looks a little bit different in kids than adults. Um, also, you're gonna leave here with just more ideas on how to effectively respond to your kids when, you're, when they are anxious um, and leave here with some tools today that I hope that are helpful. And I do wanna remind everyone that there's a lot going on in the world right now, a lot of stress, a lot of change. Um, we clinicians are seeing increased anxiety across the board. And so it's really normal during times of stress, like now to have a smaller window of tolerance, meaning you might be a little bit less patient than normal. Um, your kids might be a little bit more on edge. Everyone's a little bit more on edge, so just, Remember, that's normal considering everything that's going on right now. And a big rule that I tell all the parents I work with, don't take your kids' behaviors personally. They are not out to get you or trying to make your life harder. It's usually just they have a bunch of feelings and they don't know how to express those feelings. And just a reminder to be patient with yourself most of all because, again, times are stressful right now and being a parent is very stressful. So. I'm gonna start with what is anxiety? The dictionary de definition says that it's a feeling of worry, nervousness, unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. So uncertainty comes up a lot with people with anxiety. It's really hard to deal with uncertainty. Um, but anxiety is a normal and universal feeling. Not everyone has an anxiety disorder, but everyone has experienced anxiety at some point in their life. Anxiety basically is, for the simplest explanation, it's a stress response. It's your body's fear alarm going off. Um, something, whatever it is that triggers the anxiety tells your brain that something's not safe. Um, and your brain floods your body with a bunch of stress hormones. And that is often called fight, flight, or freeze. Um, I really like this graphic. Parents like this graphic a lot too, because I think most of us have heard of fight, flight, or freeze before, but it's hard to know what that really looks like. Um, so there's some examples there. Um, fighting is going to be more of those aggressive behaviors. Also, um, like talking back, calling people names, things like that. Just any sort of aggression, whether it's verbal or physical. And then flight behaviors are going to be more like avoidant behaviors. Um, people who procrastinate to avoid things, or maybe they retreat to their room or hide under things, that's going to be more of a flight response, but it's the same thing happening in the body, just different people respond differently to that stress, that fear alarm going off. Um, whenever anxiety is really high in kids and people in general, um, we use this, this little hand model of the brain, so if you imagine this being your brain, um, this is going to be your logical part of your brain. 
and then underneath you have your emotional part of the brain. And when things are great and everyone's feeling safe, the logical brain is in operation, it's in charge. And so that's why kids can make reasonable decisions when they feel calm and safe. Um, but then they get triggered, their anxiety gets triggered. And um, I like to call it your lid flips, your lid flips and then your logical brain goes offline and the emotional brain takes over or the fear alarm takes over. And so a lot of times when you're dealing with these behaviors, um, a lot of parents try to reason with their kids. And when kids are in the middle of feeling really anxious, their logical, the reasoning part of their brain is not working um, and it's all emotional. And so when they're in the middle of one of those fight or flight responses, that's not the time to reason with them. That's the time to help them calm down. They still need help with that. And then once they're in a calm place, that's when you can go talk about what happened and um, engage in strategies to help them with that. Um, so just a reminder, not the time to reason when they are in the middle of a stress response. Okay. So symptoms, there's a lot of symptoms right here. Um, we've kind of touched on them a little bit already, but that agitation, irritability, that's a really big one. Um, another big one I see is just that defiant behavior when kids are refusing to do something, maybe refusing to put their shoes on before you need to go somewhere, maybe taking their time, being really slow about getting ready. That can be anxiety because they're trying to avoid whatever is coming up. Refusing to go to school, meltdowns before or after school. Um, and transitions are also a really big one. Just anytime you're going from one place to another, um, that can be anxiety provoking for kids. High expectations, perfectionism, being really scared of getting questions wrong or not doing things right, that can be a sign of anxiety. Also asking a ton of questions, that can be just them overthinking things and trying to make sense of things when their brain's going a million miles an hour. So I know kids ask a lot of questions all the time, but if they are focused on one particular person or event or something like that, that can be a sign that maybe they're anxious about whatever they're asking about. Um, crying, tantrums, Headaches and stomach aches, that comes up a lot too. Sometimes kids can't tell you, I'm feeling really anxious, but they might say, oh, I have a stomach ache or my head hurts. Um, and especially if that tends to happen around like mornings when it's time to go to school or um, around those transition times, that can also clue you in that maybe they're feeling a little anxious. And then trouble concentrating is also a big one because when your mind is going a million miles an hour, it's hard to figure out what to focus on. Um, so trouble concentrating, a lot of times people jump to ADHD when that's going on, which could be the case because um, anxiety and ADHD go hand in hand sometimes. Um, but it's not always the case. Sometimes that can be just a sign that of anxiety as well. Triggers, so things that are very common to um, make that anxiety go up, trigger anxiety. Um, so change, change is a huge one. And if you think about us as adults too, like I know for me personally, I'm not a huge fan of change either. Um, and that's with my adult brain and my adult understanding of what's going on in the world. So just imagine how scary change could be to a really small person who is still figuring the world out. Um, transitions, again, anytime it's going from one place to another, um, getting ready to go somewhere, that can be really triggering for kids because they start thinking about where are we going, what's going to happen. A lot of times with anxiety, you jump to the worst case scenario and that's what kids do too. Um, unpleasant feelings, so feeling embarrassed, feeling rejected, feeling overwhelmed. If you think about how we know what we're feeling, I know Again, me as an adult, sometimes it's hard for me to figure out how I'm feeling. So again, imagine having those body sensations that clue you into feelings. So like anxiety can be butterflies in the stomach or anger sometimes, you know, your face gets really hot or whatever it is. It's usually, it usually starts with a body sensation. And so if you think about 
experiencing those body sensations, but not knowing what it is for like a four or five year old, that can be really scary. Just what is happening in my body? Feeling hungry, feeling tired. Again, it's just that uncomfortable feeling inside that they may not have figured out what exactly that is. Again, can be really scary. And then their parents or the adults in their life, if they're around to other people who are anxious, kids are like emotional sponges. They pick up on that really easily. So if you notice you're feeling anxious and notice that your kids start acting out a little bit more, that can clue you in on maybe they're picking up on some of what's going on for me. Fear of punishment can also be, you know, that, that goes in with the perfectionism and having these really high standards of I need to do this right or else I might get punished. Um, sensory overload, so a lot of screen time also can be really over, overstimulating to young brains, and so sometimes if they've been watching screens or on their tablets or things like that for a long period of time, once they get off, they're still overstimulated and it can take some work to calm them down again. Separation, strangers, people that they don't know or trust yet, and then doctor's offices, dentist's offices, things like that, where I know for me, I can remember being terrified of going to the doctor because I might get a shot. So these things that we know we have to do in our normal parts of our life can be really scary for kids. So this is just a reminder for parents. So just remembering that your kid is not willfully misbehaving. Again, they're not trying to make your life harder. They're just having a huge stress reaction and they don't know how to deal with that. So remembering that can also help you not take what's going on so personally or jump to the, I'm just a terrible parent. That's why my kid's having a meltdown. Sometimes they're just under too much stress and remembering that can help you not take it so personally and help your own stress level drop so you can calmly help them calm down as well. So that brings us to the things that I think are going to be helpful to try. Anything you're trying to incorporate with kids with anxiety, you want to increase the kids' sense of connection, sense of control, and the consistency in the kid's life. So I was trying to come up with three C's to make it simple. So connection, control, and consistency. That's what we want to increase in any of these things that we're trying to incorporate with kids. The first one, I like to call it name it to tame it. It's a fun way of remembering what this is. But if you give the feeling or the sensation that your kid is experiencing a name, that gives them one, a sense of control and two, a sense of connection because my parent or my caregiver is taking the time to help me figure out what's going on with me and they understand. So what does that look like? This graphic here is an example of a pretty typical parent or caregiver response when um, kids get upset. I'm guilty of it too. I've taught preschool for years and I know I've said some things like this. So again, don't, don't beat yourself up if this is how you've been responding. Um, but you can see she's expressing feeling upset about her turtle dying. And in this example, the dad keeps pushing her feelings away, dismissing her feelings. Um, the response of, now don't get so upset, honey. That's kind of telling her that it's wrong for you to get upset or something. It, it just gives her the message that there's something wrong with your reaction of getting upset over this. Um, a lot of times kids will act out, like in this example, you see she's getting more and more dysregulated as the dad keeps pushing her feelings away. And so she's trying to express her feelings with words and that message is not being received by the dad in this situation. And so then she starts acting out more and more. She's throwing herself on the ground. She's crying. These acting out behaviors often are just further attempts to communicate when attempts that have already been tried have not worked. Um, and so it's really important to kind of look at what the kid's saying and doing to figure out what message, like what are they trying to tell me right now? And usually when you reflect back the message they're trying to tell you, a lot of times that acting out behavior will stop because then it's like, oh, message received, I don't need to do this anymore. So this example is gonna be 
something that is, um, this is an, an example of naming, ugh, sorry, name it to tame it. So my turtle was dead. He was alive this morning. Oh no, what a shock. He's, a, he's hearing that message of you were surprised. You weren't expecting that. Um, he was my friend. So in this example, the dad is just reflecting, kind of putting the message that the daughter is giving him into his own words and saying it back to her. So she's also getting that feedback of, oh, okay, yes, these are more words of what I'm trying to communicate. And also my dad understands and he's accepting my feelings. So this increases their sense of safety and connection. Um, it also increases their sense of control because now the kid's like, oh, I have a word for what's going on inside of me. Um, the kid also feels accepted and understood in this example. So again, just reflecting back to them what they're trying to tell you, tells them I'm here, I'm trying to, you know, you're important enough for me to take the time to figure out what's going on for you and help you figure out what's going on for you. So all you really need to do in this just simple rule is say what you see, say what you hear. So if your child is old enough to be verbal and talk to you, just reflect back to them what they're saying to you in your own words. Because if you pair it, if you repeat word for word what they say, kids pick up on that too, and that can be really frustrating for them. Um, so just hear what they're saying, say it back to them, or hear, say what you're seeing. So if you see on your kid's face that they're upset or sad, you can say, you look sad right now, or seems like you're sad. Or if, you know, your kid is balling up their fists and have, has an angry expression on their face, just you're really upset right now. You're really angry right now. And just hearing that feedback can kind of give them that, oh, okay, that's what this feels like. It's anger or it's sadness. And then they don't feel the need to act out so much because their message is already getting received. A good rule of thumb that I found is, I love this, just talk to your kids like you would talk to a guest in your home. If your guests build something, you wouldn't say what's the matter with you, or you're so clumsy, or you don't ever do anything right. Um, that can be really hurtful for kids to hear. So if you're struggling with what to say, just think about would I say this to a guest in my house. And if not, maybe don't say it because your kids deserve as much respect as any other person who comes into your home. And by giving your kids respect, you're also modeling how to be respectful. So your kids are learning also how to be respectful to you as well. So routine. Routine is a huge one for kids with anxiety. It increases that consistency and the predictability in their life. Um, so we know as adults, the big wide world is not very predictable. Um, but with kids, you can at least make their little world that they're living in feel more predictable and feel like there's a system and a logical um, flow of events. So that also increases their sense of control because they understand what's going on a little bit more. So again, consistency is predictability. So ways that you can do this, if you come up with a weekly schedule, that's fine. Um, usually a good starting place is like a bedtime routine. So just do a couple of things in the same order every time around bedtime. That can look like, you know, around whatever time, seven o'clock is time to take a bath. And then after we take a bath, we brush our teeth. And then after we brush our teeth, we read a book and then it lights out. Um, it can be something as simple as that. And just that routine and the same thing happening every day, something to look forward to every day that can help calm their anxiety and make their world feel a little bit more predictable. You can also incorporate just like Taco Tuesdays or Thursday night game night. If you have something that you do every Tuesday um, or whatever day of the week, again, that's just something that gives them that sense of predictability in their life. Okay, today's Tuesday, so I know we're having tacos for dinner today. It's calming to them because they have some predictability there. Be realistic with this though. If you're the type that, I think it's really easy for people to get excited with this kind of stuff and then they're like, okay, I'm gonna plan out every minute of every day and this is gonna be our schedule. If you plan a schedule, make sure it's something that you can stick to realistically and routinely. 
because if you start something and then you're not able to stay with it and incorporate it and be consistent with it, then that can also increase anxiety in your kids. So if that's something that you can maintain, by all means do that. But if you're not the type of person to you know, go by a schedule and if that's gonna make you even more anxious trying to make it work consistently, then it's not worth it. So if all you wanna do is bedtime routines, that's fine. Just know yourself and know what you can realistically incorporate. Calendars, chore charts on the fridge, anything that's visual that your kids can see is helpful too. I don't know about you guys, but I love having a calendar and a planner so I can look and see what my week looks like. That gives me a little bit more control or that sense of control over my life. Um, kids are the same way. So it's helpful for them to have a visual so then they know it's not just I've had a lot of kids who are like, oh no, my parents are just trying to trick me when they say that. But if you have a visual to back you up, you can be like, look, you know, this is your, um, this is on the calendar. I'm not lying to you. Um, the picture I have here is of like a little chore chart with like visuals for younger kids who can't read yet. That's really helpful as if you're trying to incorporate chores and stuff like that. And I really like this clock activity and a lot of parents and kids like that too. You can take out the inside of a clock and color it the way it is in this example. And that also gives your kids a visual of um, what's to be expected, even if they can't tell time yet. And so it also takes some pressure off of you as the parent because you're not having to like watch the clock for them. They can start looking at the clock and seeing, oh, this is what time it is and what I'm supposed to be doing right now. It also allows them to look and be like, oh, I only have this much more time instead of that being sprung on them. But five or 15 minute countdowns, just depending on the kid, can also be really helpful. So if they're in the middle of playtime and you know that it's almost time to clean up, give them a five minute warning. Okay, five minutes until it's time to clean up. Because um, sometimes when something's sprung on them, like a surprise, if you're just like, out of nowhere, it's time to clean up, that can also trigger anxiety. Um, so giving them a heads up, I know me as an adult, I appreciate a heads up sometimes. So giving them a heads up is also really appreciated for kids. So five minutes. I also put 15 minutes, because sometimes if you're like at a park or something, it can be harder for them to wind down and realize it's time to go. So 15 minutes, then 10 minutes, five minutes but always give them one more minute. You want them to have multiple warnings because sometimes I'm sure you guys know kids don't hear you the first time. So that also gives them additional heads up as well. So that brings me to boundaries and limits. Um, that is going to be, it's gonna provide structure and guidance on what's acceptable. Structure equals safety, more predictability, a lot of times parents and caregivers just say like, no, don't do that, but they don't give them any guidance on what they are supposed to be doing. So um, this gives, it, gives them some guidance on what's acceptable and what's not. We use the ACT model. So ACT, acknowledge the feeling first. So that goes back to step one, name it to tame it. You're really angry right now. You're really upset. Um, communicate the limit very matter-of-factly. So not, you don't hit your brother, because that sounds very blaming and shaming to the kid, and kids with anxiety are really sensitive to that. They want to do things right. Um, so just matter-of-fact, brother's not for hitting, the wall's not for drawing on, whatever it is that they're doing. Keep that language passive and not, you don't do that. And then you target an alternative. So that's gonna give them a clue as far as what they can do. So brother's not for hitting, you can choose to tell brother what's wrong or you can go hug your teddy or if they really need to hit something sometimes they do because they're trying to get rid of that anxiety that's built up in their body um i like to give them an alternative you know brother's not for hitting you can go hit the pillow if you need to hit something but you can see at the end you give them a choice there and that brings me to the next one choices um, choices also increase that sense of control in your kids. So a lot of, I've heard a lot of kids say, you know, how come grownups get to make the rules? How come I never get to make the rules? They feel powerless. They like to feel in control of things and choices gives them that sense of control without giving them all of the control. So it's 
typically good to only offer two choices because more than one choice can be really overwhelming to a kid with anxiety. You think about um, when your partner is like, hey, where do you want to eat tonight? And you're like, mm, I don't know. It's a little bit different than being like, hey, do you want to eat at Chili's or Applebee's tonight? That narrows it down and then it's not as overwhelming. Um, make sure the choices you give them are both acceptable in your opinion and manageable. So if you are trying to figure out what they want for breakfast, let's say, and you're like, do you want milk or apple juice this morning? If you don't have apple juice, don't offer apple juice because then what happens if they do choose apple juice? Then it's going to be a whole thing. So make sure you can do what the choices are and make sure you're okay with them. So um, again, if you're, if it's breakfast time and you're like, would you like eggs for breakfast or cake for breakfast? And you really don't want your kid having cake for breakfast. Don't offer that because what if your kid chooses cake, then you're going to have to say no. And that completely undoes what we're trying to do here as far as their sense of control. So when they're acting out again, giving them a choice is going to put them back in control. I have a lot of kids who see me in the playroom who really don't want to leave at the end of session and they start, you know, stomping their feet and no, I don't want to leave. And that's usually when I say, again, acknowledge the feeling, oh, you really don't want to leave, but it's time to go. Would you like to skip down the hallway or hop down the hallway? So I'm not giving them a choice on, do you want to stay or go? We're going, but they get to choose how they leave. And again, that gives them that sense of, oh, okay, I at least have a choice in this situation. And then finally, we have get moving. Um, so exercise, movement is going to be great. A lot of anxious kids are in their heads a lot. They're thinking, 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 and coming up with imaginary scenarios. Getting them moving is gonna get them out of their head and back into their body. It's also going to release endorphins. So when they have that stress response, their stress alarm goes off, they get flooded with a bunch of stress hormones. Exercise um, releases endorphins, which actually counteract those stress hormones. And so anything that's gonna be movement, you know, yoga, dancing, going outside and just running around and playing, um, that's gonna be really helpful with everything that's going on with the stress response. It's also a great opportunity to get outside, which can also be calming, just being out in nature. And then it's a good opportunity to take a break from that screen time. And then finally, we have mindfulness. That's kind of a buzzword in the therapy world right now, but it's really just simple explanation is being aware of what's happening right now in the present moment. So this graphic shows you a lot of times um, spending too much time thinking about the past. You're just beating yourself up about things you should have or could have done. It makes you feel sad and things like that. Or alternatively, spending too much time thinking about the future, like what if this happens? What if everything goes wrong? Both of those things can be really detrimental to people dealing with anxiety. So being in the present moment it gets you out of your head into what's happening right now. And usually the present moment is really all anyone has control over. So that just, it can be really calming. Mindfulness activities for kids, five senses activities. So some people call this the five, four, three, two, one, but you just go through the senses. So name five things you can see, four, three, four things you can hear, three things you can smell. Um, that can be a way of getting them out of their head and into what's happening right now and back into their body. Just going on a walk and seeing what you notice when you're actually taking the time to notice things, that's also a great opportunity to play like I Spy or something, that's kind of a mindfulness activity. Um, cooking and cleaning, that's gonna be great too because if you're cooking, you have to be paying attention to right now so you don't burn things. Um, cleaning, you're you know, looking at what's right in front of you. And also with cooking and cleaning, there's a lot of repetitive motions. So like sweeping, you know, rubbing, like rubbing stains out, things like that, or stirring with cooking, anything repetitive, that's that consistency. Um, that's going to be really, if your brain really likes those motions. So those motions can be really calming too. And then deep breathing. So blowing bubbles and pinwheels are great ways of, um, getting your kids to practice deep breathing. Because when you blow bubbles, if you blow like really hard, you're not gonna get very much bubbles. But if you blow long and slow, you're gonna get more bubbles. Um, so trying that, I like to have kids blow bubbles and then count the bubbles. 
that they blew. That is very much in the present moment. And then pinwheels, I like to encourage kids to see how long they can make the pinwheel go versus how fast they can make the pinwheel go, because that's going to get them to do those big, long, deep breaths in and out. And then the ninja walk is just a fun activity you can even do inside if you can't get outside, but just have your kids try to walk like ninjas. They have to be quiet to do this. They also have to pay attention to what's around them so they don't run into things or knock things over. But the, the goal is, let's see how quiet you can be and how sneaky you can be. And that can give you a break if they're being a little bit too loud as well. And then finally, just a reminder for parents, self-care is not selfish. You have got to take care of yourself before you can help your kids take care of themselves. So helping yourself, doing things that fill you back up because you can't pour from an empty cup, that's going to be really important for you to be able to parent effectively. So just some permission to take some time for yourself as well if you can. That's what I have for you. I'm sorry about rushing, but we were running out of time. So I do want to, if you can just give me one second, if I can pull up, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so I know I just rushed through a bunch of that, but if you guys have any questions,